Again, good evening, everyone. i uh, ex excited here to have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the topic of MIGS and specifically on irrigating goniectomy. And I want to start off by mentioning my financial disclosures. I am a uh, notable here, a uh, speaker and consultant for MST. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is what is uh, irrigating goniectomy? We're going to talk about uh, what are the features specifically of Trebectome and Trebex and Trebex Plus. Uh, what, what are they and how are they different from other MIGS procedures that are available? We'll also talk about some steps of selecting patients. Uh, as Eric mentioned, I've written a book about patient selection specifically for trabectome or irrigating goniectomy, and I'm going to share with you who are good candidates and who are candidates that we should avoid so we can make sure we have good outcomes. Uh, we'll then also talk about the why, why we choose this kind of procedure by going over clinical data uh, that is supportive um, of the efficacy and the safety profiles. And then we'll go into surgical steps. I'm excited to share with you some nice videos uh, helping with pearls uh, of surgical techniques, things to do and things to avoid. And then we'll go into some post-operative management considerations and discuss what to do post-operatively. And then I'm excited about the Q&A session because um, I've been isolated with this COVID. I'm really excited about having the opportunity to talk to you guys uh, and share some insights and uh, discussion about um, MIGS in general. All right, so are you in the right place? Well, you definitely are in the right place if you have been thinking about needing another option for your current MIGS approaches. Maybe you're not quite in getting your target pressures with the procedures you're doing right now and you want some other options, you're definitely in the right place if you're considering that. And you're also in the right place if you have a number of phagic and pseudophagic patients that need a standalone option. Uh, patients that might not be ready for the traditional glaucoma surgery, maybe they failed the, um, the uh, meds with uh, SLT, uh, and you need something that is less invasive um, but standalone. Uh, and then also you're in the right place if you're looking just to add another mixed procedure to your armamentarium that has a simple learning curve. Uh, Trebectum was the first procedure that I uh, performed uh, um, back in 2009, and I definitely felt that it allowed me to have a a very easy learning curve for a new MIGS procedure, and we'll share with you some of those uh, reasons why that might be the case for you. So when we talk about problems, um, you know, uh, with technology and with advancements, uh, we run into problems and those problems end up helping us to guide into uh, discovering new technologies and new advances that can be more helpful. And that was definitely the case uh, with um, glaucoma surgery. We all are very aware of the glaucoma surgical problems, uh, whereas with our standard uh, trabeculectomy and our um, traditional tube shunts, they can be very effective in helping to lower the pressure. We all know very well that they can also lead to complications, and those complications can be vision threatening and uh, that can undermine the whole purpose of why we were doing the surgery, which was to preserve and save vision. Uh, also, we have medicines on the other side that uh, can also bring problems, although they're very simple to in instill in the eye. Um, there can be other reasons. Uh, maybe that doesn't work. Maybe you need a lot of medicines in order to help lower the pressure. And then maybe patients aren't compliant, or maybe they are compliant, but their eyes are irritated and they can't tolerate the medicine, or the medicines are too expensive and they can't afford them. So there's a lot of problems also with medications that have led us to the need for something different, which is mix. Uh, in addition to glaucoma, a lot of patients who have glaucoma also have comorbid cataracts. And uh, we may know the statistic that about four to five million uh, cataract surgeries are performed every year. And about 20% of those patients are using at least one uh, glaucoma medication or more. And that means that over 700,000 patients a year could be a candidate for a combined procedure. Uh, one question I always want to ask people as they're um, talking about MIGS and entering into the realm of MIGS is, uh, how many of you, um, and this might be a question if you can answer into the poll, and maybe we can go over that later in the Q&A section, how many of you actually still use uh, uh, cataract surgery alone in patients who have glaucoma and are on at least one medication? Maybe they're controlled, um, but uh, do you just do cataract, how many of you just do cataract surgery alone? And the reason why I ask that is that question was um, uh, kind of posed to me earlier on, and I wanted to actually ask patients, uh, even if they were doing okay with their glaucoma medications, but a lot of patients say I'm doing fine with my glaucoma medications, I wondered how many of them, if they have the option, would want to have a combined procedure. So we asked that question. Uh, we did a poll in our clinic, uh, over 50 patients who are being evaluated for cataract surgery who also happened to have glaucoma and were on at least one medication. 
they were asked if they would be interested, at least uh, somewhat to very interested, in having another procedure at the same time as their cataract surgery that could help to uh, potentially lower their, um, need, reduce their need for medicines, maybe, maybe one or more. And the reality is that the majority of them, almost 90% of them, were uh, at least a little interested or very interested in having that opportunity. So it's something for us to make sure that we're giving our patients that mixed choice because our patients, uh, just like our cataract patients, uh, they want to see and they want to see in the ways where if possible, they could reduce their, their burdens um, and reduce and uh, have more convenience if that's possible. We're in the day, day and age where our patients are getting older and uh, they're able to be active um, and they want to be able to have that ability to have a, a good lifestyle, which can include reducing medications and the burden that's daily. So MIGS presents a lot of advantages and I think that uh, we're all aware um, we've been doing MIGS for some time and there's uh, a lot of understanding that it can help improve compliance, it can reduce costs for patients, um, the procedures compared to traditional glaucoma surgeries are faster, they have faster recovery time, less follow-up, less chair time. So a lot of advantages for patients as well as advantages for doctors. Um, there's uh, less uh, fluctuation in uh, eye pressures compared to um, medical management. There's also the ability to combine it with cataract surgery and get um, dual um, benefits for the patients. Um, and then there's uh, other risks that are reduced, like lifelong risks of um, blebs with um, possible potential blood uh, complications of infection and leaks. Um, and that equals happier patients, which definitely equals happier doctors. So we've just talked about the why mix, and it's very clear why. So let's talk about specifically irrigating goniectomy. Why consider this and what is it? So when we talk about the mechanism of action relating to goniotomy or goniectomy, um, we're talking about the removal, removal of tissue, the trabecular meshwork that's considered an area of high resistance. By removing this trabecular meshwork, we can expose access to the collector channel so that there can be direct flow and increase of that outflow and lowering of eye pressure. So when we're talking about irrigating goniectomy, uh, the idea is uh, not just removing some or opening some of the trabecular meshwork, but actually removing a strip of uh, trabecular tissue uh, from uh, that area and in roofing uh, to allow exposure to those uh, collector channels in a way where the leaflets of the trabectome uh, or, or the trabecular meshwork that are left are wide and um, uh, apart from each other so there's less risk for any kind of uh, scarring or closing off of those uh, channels that were opened. Then the irrigating aspect is doing this with uh, the use of fluidics with irrigation and aspiration. And this fluidics is really the key of why uh, this can, um, uh, the irrigating aspect can really help aid in the learning curve of performing the goniectomy because it provides pressurization of the chamber, which provides ability for there to be a stable cornea, a clear cornea, uh, stable uh, structures, and pressure against those collector channels that are being exposed so there isn't reflux of blood. With little heme to no heme in the anterior chamber, a clear view, it allows for you to be able to focus on the anatomical structure so that you can perform the procedure more easily. And this is very important when you're novice and when you're trying to just get a handle on the, uh, the basics of angle surgery. Uh, so goniectomy is a very uh, long-standing history of removing that um, trabecular meshwork tissue to be able to expose the channels and allow for um, uh, increase of outflow. Uh, and because of the wide space that you're opening, that strip that you're removing, uh, as I mentioned before, you're pro providing a lasting exposure to those collector channels because you've opened the tissue wide enough so that it won't scar with those leaflets. Um, here in, uh, in this slide, we'll talk specifically about trabectome. So trabectome was uh, really the first MIGS procedure. It was FDA approved in 2006. And uh, this is a procedure that actually has the most clinical data and research because it's been out for over a decade. There's over 130 peer-reviewed articles about it. And what trabectome is, it's, it's a whole system. So instead of thinking of it as um, a handpiece, and there are certain features of the handpiece that make it unique, but it is a whole system. Um, as seen here on the slide, there is um, a unit, and there's a, a lecture unit. Uh, there's also an irrigation unit. Um, and this is um, uh, aided by a foot pedal that allows you to have access to this irrigation and uh, electroablation uh, technique. 
So the handpiece, uh, what's special about the handpiece, um, I think it's uh, uh, might be underneath uh, the picture, but the handpiece has a uh, return electrode and an um, active electrode, and this is where the electroablation occurs. Uh, but then it has a special foot plate, and it's that foot plate that is protected um, by um, a special coating that allows for minimization of heat. So that as the electroablation is occurring, there is protection of the outer wall of Schlem's canal so that uh, it won't be damaged. And this is important because this is where the opening of the ostium of the um, collector channels is. And we want to make sure that those are protected because of those are the avenues to the outflow. Uh, here at the top of uh, the pink um, picture, you see a histopathology. This is showing TM tissue. Uh, the arrows are indicating where the um, Schlem's canal is. It's here flattened. Um, and then next to that is the trabecular mesh with tissue. And you see in the second picture, the post-surgery, and this is where the trabecular mesh with tissue has been removed. And you can see that the leaflets are, um, at the edges of the trabecular mesh with tissue are far apart because that's because of that central strip that has been removed uh, so that um, there is wide exposure of these um, uh, collector channels. This is a video showing some steps of the trabectome procedure. I'm here and getting a good initial view uh, and now I'm making an incision with the 1. millimeter blade that is given in the pack. I'm on continuous irrigation and I'm entering the eye which then expands and provides pressurization of the chamber. Uh, viscoelastic is placed and the uh, prism is placed and I am piercing the TM with a tip going into Schlem's canal. And I pause here because I want to make sure I'm in the right position. And then I press on the pedal to uh, initiate ablation. And I continue to go an, an arc um, uh, in a di uh, direction um, to the left. Um, and then after I've gone for about uh, two to three clock hours, I turn the handpiece and then I go in the other direction. It's important to understand that there can be a um, starting and stopping, that's okay. Sometimes you get a nice strip and you continue to go in one motion all the way across. The most important thing is that it's going to be something that glides very easily. Uh, it shouldn't be something that there's a lot of jerking of the eye. And we'll talk about that in some videos later. Now, talking about the Trebex and the Trebex Plus, how they differ from Trebectome is that these are single unit devices as opposed to a whole fluidic system. So there's no electro uh, ablation here. Where the action is, is in the serrated blades. The very uh, blades are cut to be sharp so that they can excise the trabecular meshwork tissue. And there is a certain width of the, uh, of the tips of those blades so that that band, that central band that is being removed of the trabecular meshwork is wide enough, again, to separate those leaflets so there is minimization of um, a scarring um, uh, and closure of the collector channels. Um, with the Trebex, this is just a, stand, a hand piece with, that is, is, has the incision aspect of the trabecular meshwork removal. With the Trebex Plus, this is now um, that um, serrated blade plus an irrigation and aspiration system. Now, where does the irrigation and aspiration come from? Um, it comes from um, uh, the units that are attached to it. And, and in the next slide, I'll talk about that. So here is some um, histology pictures, uh, again, showing trabecular meshwork tissue before and then after. And in the after picture, you can see that the um, trabex um, uh, blades have uh, removed, excised that trabecular meshwork tissue in a uh, central strip uh, that uh, leaves the leaflets far apart from each other, again, for um, uh, reducing the ability of closure. Uh, here is a um, video of a wet lab um, excision of a corneal rim. And here the Trebex uh, Plus is being used. And as you can see, there is excision of the trabecular meshwork tissue. And the person is pulling back to show you the strip that has been excised um, with the Trebex, uh, Trebex tip. Um, what's also interesting is as they are cutting, um, there's that nice central strip. Uh, they'll pull back to see, to show you what that strip is and then they'll re-engage in the irrigation and you'll see a pulling back of that tissue within the handpiece. And this is because the irrigation um, and aspiration 
the aspiration of the, the, the vacuum is allowing for that tissue to be um, uh, excised and removed into the, the handpiece. Um, and as a side, uh, there are other um, um, uh, goniotomy um, procedures that can be done uh, like the KDB. And in my experience of using it, I've gotten good results, but I've also sometimes been a bit frustrated with uh, the leaflets that are remaining of the trabecular mesh or tissue that can sometimes be difficult for me to, to remove. Uh, what is uh, beneficial with the Trebex Plus is the irrigation aspect or the um, aspiration aspect to help remove. And that's also happening with the trabectome. The aspiration is helping to remove um, debris of the trabecular meshwork as it's being ablated. So again, a nice feature of the irrigating aspect of irrigating goniectomy. Um, this is a video, um, uh, I think this is Brian Francis, who's doing a video of uh, trabectome, uh, Trebex, Trebex Plus. He's making his corneal incision, and then he's putting um, some uh, anesthetic in the eye. And then he will uh, next put in uh, the instrument of the Trebex Plus. Uh, and you can see there's some deepening of the chamber because of the irrigation. Uh, you see a good view of the angle structures. Um, and then he pierces the tip of the TM uh, with the Trebex uh, Plus tip. Um, and makes a uh, goniectomy incision in one direction. Uh, and then he'll turn the tip around and uh, perform uh, some additional uh, excision in the other direction. Now, typically uh, you wanna ablate about 90 uh, to 180 degrees. Um, it can sometimes be difficult to get a whole 180 degrees, but uh, at least 90 degrees is considered adequate. One question I often get is um, when there's bleeding in the eye, I might be concerned about being able to have good visualization for the rest of the procedure. Here he's putting viscoelastic in the eye in order to do his cataract procedure. What the viscoelastic does right after the um, uh, irrigating uh, goniectomy procedure is it allows for the removal and the tamponade of those exposed collector channels. Uh, so when there's pressurization in the eye, you clear out that blood so that there is a very clear view for the rest of the case. So it's not really a concern of being able to um, have adequate view for the rest of the, the cataract procedure when I do uh, the irrigating goniectomy procedure first. So I was mentioning before about Tribex um, uh, Plus. Is, it is a single hand piece unit, but it is compatible with any kind of faker machine. There's no specific brand that's necessary to use it. It can be used with anything that has an irrigation and aspiration port. And so it makes it very versatile. So the settings that are um, ideal um, are listed here. So what you first want to do is prime the uh, faker machine as you normally would. And then you're going to connect the um, Trebex uh, plus uh, irrigation and aspiration um, tubing with that of the FACO machine. And then you'll set the irrigation height at at least 80 um, um, or more centimeters um, of the, um, the bottle height. And then the aspiration will be set at uh, 10 cc's per, per minute. And then the vacuum can be set about 100 to 150. Um, these are the ideal settings. They can be adjusted somewhat. Uh, it's not um, it has to be exact, but uh, this is what is typically um, used in order to have uh, good settings. So we've just gone over the, um, the why of the MIGs and uh, the um, what is uh, irrigating goniectomy and uh, some of the features specifically of Trebectome and Trebex and Trebex Plus. And so now we're going to go into the why use it. Um, uh, the clinical studies that show the efficacy of these procedures. So the first thing I want to talk about is this meta-analysis that was done with, uh, by Nilsen Owen and his group. And what he wanted to do is he knew that there was already about a decade of information about uh, Trebecto. And he wanted to be able to look at the studies and kind of concisely say, okay, what are the best studies saying? Um, so he went on, uh, did a thorough search in PubMed, also looked at abstracts that were coming from major meetings like AGS, ASKERS, AO, and ARVO, and uh, looked to see of that literature, um, what were the best studies. So he wheedled it down to 14 studies to include in the meta-analysis. And those are made mainly uh, prospective or retrospective cohort studies. And what he found collectively was there was um, about a 36% reduction in IOP from baseline 
and that there was a final average high pressure that was typically in the mid teens around 16 and that there was about a um, reduction of um, medications by about one. Um, he also had found that there was a very low complication rate, less than 1% of any site uh, threatening complications. Now, this was a very important study because um, in uh, uh, looking at the various studies here, the 14 are listed. Um, these are um, uh, outlining, this uh, table outlines, there's the type of study, uh, the total uh, number within the study and several of them had some larger numbers. Um, there was a mean baseline pressure um, for the uh, um, uh, trabectome only group was about 26 and for the trabectome phago group was about 21. And the mean final pressures typically were in the mid-teen range as you, as you can see here more or less. Um, and so there was about on average about 36% drop from baseline uh, for the group. Uh, and this uh, was, uh, these studies are, are, have good longevity. The majority of them are at least 12 months or more. Um, there's one that was six months, but the majority are, are long-term studies. Uh, so this is an important um, evaluation showing uh, a good efficacious uh, drop in pressure and also reduction in medication. Uh, this is a study looking at um, uh, goniotomy with active IA. So looking at the uh, um, dual blade goniotomy, uh, whether it's active, meaning with irrigation, like in the Trebex Plus, or whether it's passive, um, and uh, passive meaning uh, will know an irrigation and use of viscoelastic. So basically the study was looking at um, uh, some aids in the concept of learning curve. So as I mentioned before, one of the um, uh, good things about learning curve is being able to have a um, stable chamber. That stable chamber means um, good uh, stabilization of the structures, pressurization, clear cornea, clear view, less heme. Uh, and so the study looks at the active um, uh, dual blade goniotomy uh, on the um, uh, 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 figure where it says A, uh, the baseline for uh, active and the D baseline for passive show a chamber that, um, a, ch a normal chamber depth, and this is before any incisions are made. Then during the um, surgery, there's a start, and at the start, uh, that's when you have um, the irrigation going for the active, and then you have the viscoelastic that's uh, fully uh, opening the chamber um, uh, and the passive, um, the B and the E. And then as the surgery goes on with the irrigation, you still have continuous um, irrigation throughout, so the chamber stays well maintained throughout. Um, but with the viscoelastic or with the passive um, uh, DBG, there is a significant reduction of the chamber. Uh, and when that happens, there is um, some loss of the corneal uh, view because there could be corneal folds. Um, there's um, typically egress of heme because there's no pressure, pressurization to tampon out those collector channels. So it uh, is showing some of the benefits that happen with the irrigation aspect. And then in this slide, it um, further looked at how well the, there was um, irrigation uh, through the collector channels using fluorescence. And what was seen was in all of the quadrants, there was some uptake of increase of outflow. Um, there seemed to be a little bit more in the active, but looking statistically, there wasn't any difference between the two. Uh, in this study, this um, was done by uh, Sameh Mosaid, and she looked at a large group of patients. And this, there was a uh, trabectone database of collective uh, cases uh, around the uh, country and over uh, 4,500 trabectone surgeries uh, were performed over a 90 month period. And she was looking at the outcomes and um, defining um, success as a pressure, uh, reduction of pressure at least 20% or more from baseline um, and a pressure uh, under 21 millimeters of mercury and no additional glaucoma surgery. And what was found was that uh, there was about a 66% success for trabectome alone after about 90 months. And in the trabectome plus phaco group, uh, there was an 85% success um, after 60 months or five years. Um, the concept of the trabectome plus phaco having a um, uh, greater longevity um, for uh, uh, or greater um, survival um, uh, has been shown in many studies. And I'll share a study of my own that also um, uh, is consistent with that. Um, and in the studies, there was a consistency of pressure reduction, as you can see um, in the graphs uh, for both the pressure and also reduction of medications. 
Now this is another study by Brian Francis, and this is where he was uh, earlier on looking between phaco uh, plus trabectone versus phaco alone. And uh, he had looked at a number of patients and did also um, matched pair analysis um, between the two groups. Um, and those figures were very interesting. Here in this graph, um, the um, red line indicates the baseline eye pressure for both groups. And the um, uh, dotted line is the group of phaco alone. And what's noted is very early on, there was a pressure spike and then the pressure drops below baseline but over the course of the year, it starts to trend up and actually go above where the baseline pressures were. Um, however, with the trabectone phaco group, uh, there was an initial decrease in eye pressure, and then, it's this, nine o'clock. and then this eye pressure was consistently lowered over the course of the year. Now, uh, also with um, the trabectone plus phaco, the survival, um, again, was eight, at 80% versus uh, the phaco alone that was at 45%. And so, um, uh, again, noting that the trabectome aspect um, significantly helps in the reduction of pressure over a significant amount of time. Uh, this is another study um, looking at narrow angles. Uh, now, at one point, it was seen as a contraindication to do um, a narrow angle patients with um, at this type of mixed procedure. Um, but this study uh, opened up eyes to the fact that whether done um, uh, narrow angles of uh, grade uh, three or, or wider, versus narrow angles that were, um, uh, that were grade two or below, um, whether being done phaco uh, with trabectum or trabectum alone, there was a reduction in eye pressure um, over a substantial amount of time. And so um, this shows that uh, the procedure can do well even in narrow angles. And this is another study that was looking at um, more severe glaucoma. So um, the study graded patients and gave them what's called a glaucoma index uh, number. And that was based on their visual field score, the severity of the visual field, the number of preoperative meds, and the uh, preoperative eye pressure. And in this study, the um, higher group number, um, or GI uh, glaucoma index number, um, indicated more severity. And what they found is that uh, with uh, larger eye pressure reductions um, for the more severe glaucoma groups, there are actually larger eye pressure reductions. So to say that even in patients who have severe glaucoma, um, one can get a very good outcome uh, using the trabectum to lower the eye pressure. Uh, this is a study uh, also uh, looking at trabectum that looked at um, uh, trabectum after failed trabeculectomy. Uh, so there are a number of patients who've had trabeculectomy and um, they have uncontrolled pressures and one wonders what to do next. Well, the study looked at patients who had trabectome or trabectome combined with phaco and found that, yes, even after failed trabeculectomy, patients can have a good outcome with uh, trabectome or trabectome phaco procedure. And it's not to say that the collector channels have atrophy, they can actually still be um, able to be well utilized with the removal of that TM. Uh, then this is a study that compared trabectome to Ahmed valves. Um, and very interestingly, um, they took patients and they matched them uh, between Ahmed's and uh, trabectome patients. Um, uh, and what they found was that the pressure reduction was similar uh, between groups, uh, between Ahmed valves and trabectome. And they also found that the reduction of medications was actually lower uh, in the trabectome group compared with the Ahmed valve. And the same finding in another study that looked at trabectome compared with air valve also found similar findings where pressure reduction um, in match patients was similar and then uh, over a, a significant amount of time. Uh, and then the um, pressure uh, medication reduction was also lower uh, for the trabectome group compared to bare belts. And so uh, this is um, uh, to show that trabectome, uh, even though considered minimally uh, microincision uh, surgery, can be very effective and comparable to results that are came from what we consider our traditional glaucoma surgeries. So again, now covering the what uh, and the why, um, let's talk about how to get started with some tips. So when thinking about um, MIGs, what are the uses? What are the on-label uses? Uh, well, when you um, compare goniectomy uh, to stents, uh, there is a big difference on what is allowed or what is considered on-label. So for goniectomy, it's a very wide range of options. It can be open angle, narrow angle, primary, secondary, adult, pediatric, pseudoxfoliative, 
uh, mild or moderate or severe with a cataract or is standalone. Whereas when you talk about stents, um, such as with the eye stent or with the hydrus, uh, these can be effective procedures, but they can be limited. Limited because um, they have to be open angle. It has to be primary. It has to be an adult. It has to be mild or moderate. Um, it has to be done with the cataract surgery. Uh, so uh, one of the great things that I've found uh, with irrigating goniectomy is its versatility. You can use it in a wide range of patients. So when you're starting out uh, with any procedure, you want to look for the most ideal candidates. And this is important so that you can get good outcomes because more successful good outcomes make you want to continue to use the procedure more. And then as you um, finesse and fine tune your surgical skill set, uh, you will expand your reach of who you use this for. So typically for an ideal patient, uh, you want to make sure that your expectation and goals are set adequately. You want to under promise but over deliver. So you are looking for typically patients that you want to get about a 20 to 30% reduction of eye pressure uh, or get their pressure to be within the teen range. That's what's typical. Um, maybe you want to get them off at least one medication when they're already controlled. That is typical. So you look for candidates that you can get that kind of outcome. Um, is it possible that you can find a patient who has maximal medical therapy, um, they have a still very high pressure and they can still be a good candidate uh, for irrigating goniectomy? Yes, that can happen. Um, also, you want to make sure that they have good nerve reserve. In the next slide, I'll talk about what that is. But again, you don't want to set yourself up for failure, so you want to get patients who are typically ideal. Um, mild to moderate, um, that goal of 20-30% reduction on mid-teens then maybe reduce uh, medications by about one. Now, when I talk about nerve reserve, I'm talking about the concept of having some reserve of that uh, rim of tissue. So you are looking for cuptus ratios about 0.75 uh, or better. Um, is it possible that this can be done in more severe cases? Yes, but again, like I mentioned, try to go for the ideal patients first um, and then get your, um, your comfortable um, and skill set up and then move on to more um, uh, extreme patients. Uh, and then the visual field in the OCT should match that mild to moderate uh, defect for that uh, nerve. Uh, again, good patients um, uh, are patients who are on topical medications with cataract surgery, and this can be whether they're controlled or uncontrolled. Uh, maybe your goal is to get them off medications or uh, get them to their target pressure. Uh, any stages of opening of glaucoma, um, this can be first line after a failed laser treatment. Um, maybe they can tolerate the meds, maybe they can't. Uh, maybe they're not compliant. Uh, again, reasons to consider using this before going to more traditional surgeries. Hands down, this is the first procedure I would use for exfoliation. I found in my experience that um, it works extremely well. Um, and I would, after attempting medicines and um, um, uh, laser treatment, um, this would be the next procedure that I would consider. Um, it can be used also, um, as we mentioned, in failed trabeculectomy. I found that sometimes when patients have had a bad outcome of a traditional surgery in one eye and they're very scared about doing any kind of procedure in the other eye, this type of procedure does work really well because it's very well tolerated um, in terms of the healing process. It's uh, typically so much better than what they have experienced before. Uh, patients are really happy. Um, also, uh, this is really good for patients who have high risk, like myopes, high myopes. The um, uh, anatomy is usually very uh, wide open uh, and great for this kind of angle surgery um, to help avoid like traditional glaucoma surgery, like a bleb uh, that can make them prone to getting uh, choroidals or hypotony maculopathy. Um, very good for monocular patients when you want to do a procedure um, that is kind of gentle on the eye. Um, and also the um, patients who are uh, standalone faded, fake or pseudophagic. And I've also found really good um, success with using this in narrow angle patients who have a bit of angle synegii. The tip of the trabeculectome works very well to help tease away synegii and have been able to open up the angle and then the uh, trabeculectome procedure to remove that uh, strip of uh, TM. Uh, so this is a study that actually I did um, with a question of what are the characteristics for success with trabectome? And I had access to a database of over, uh, almost 700 patients, including some of my own. And we looked at patients who were fake if who had trabectome, either trabectome alone or trabectome with cataract surgery. 
And what we found was overall, there was about a 32% reduction of eye pressure and about one medication reduction. And the characteristics for success included patients who had pseudoxfoliation, who seemed to do better. Um, patients, both who had trabectome and alone and trabectome with FACO had good pressure reduction. But uh, again, the trabectome combined with FACO had longer uh, longevity of success. Um, we also found that patients who had higher preoperative eye pressures uh, did better. Um, and then um, in our population, uh, patients who were Hispanic uh, did better uh, compared with um, uh, patients uh, who are Caucasian. So just as importantly as patients who are good candidates are also important patients knowing who are poor candidates so that you can make sure that you have good outcomes. So you want to avoid patients who have really heavy uh, sneaky angle closure and those are patients like those who have chronic uveitis or uh, chronic angle closure with really heavy PAS uh, 360. Um, you want to avoid neovascular glaucoma patients. Uh, patients with plateau iris because of their angle anatomy and um, uh, predisposition to getting um, sinucleal closure after. Um, also, you want to avoid angle recession or traumatic patients. And then those patients who have corneal opacity, if you cannot see the angle structures in good detail, then they're not a good candidate. So you don't you're set yourself up for um, failure in that way. So in this next step uh, for success is the examination. And there's important things to take note of in the examination. Uh, the number of medications that the patient is on, um, the uh, pressure before. Um, as we measure, mentioned, um, there are some associations with uh, the higher number of uh, medications and the higher eye pressure is doing even better um, uh, in terms of expectation. Uh, slit lamp uh, exam can uh, help you find uh, secondary characteristics like pseudoxfoliation or pigment dispersion or synethii um, that's heavy. Uh, you can also look for the, um, the stage of the glaucoma by looking at the nerve uh, and assessing uh, that in the diagnostic tests associated with it to get an understanding of what stage you're working with. And then uh, another part of the exam that's vitally important is gonioscopy. Uh, one cannot stress enough the importance of gonioscopy and getting really comfortable with doing it. It's something that actually can also um, affect your financial bottom line because it is a billable procedure um, and it's something that you need to do very often if you're doing a mixed surgery, both in the preoperative stage and also in the postoperative stage um, to make sure that there isn't any complication. Uh, you're going to be looking for the angle depth, secondary uh, characteristics, and uh, the ability to get a good view through the cornea. Uh, and then um, the next step is um, choosing. You want to make sure that you're choosing good candidates. And this is uh, a case um, that is a good candidate that we'll go through now. So there was a patient who ha was 83, year old, uh, 83 years old, a male, and he was getting evaluated for uh, narrow angles. And he had um, uh, complaints of blurred vision, especially in the left eye, that had been progressive over almost a year. Uh, his pressures were elevated, 24 in the left eye and 21 in the right eye. Uh, his uh, bilateral, uh, bilaterally had cataracts, uh, three plus NS. And uh, he had a very narrow angle in the right eye and occludable angle in the left eye. So he had a YAG PI uh, that was performed in the left eye and started on Lumigan. And um, he was, uh, had pressures that reduced uh, to 20 uh, and 17. And he was at this point um, mentioning that he had some concern about his vision. Uh, on examination, uh, he had vision that was 20 20 on the right and 2025 in the left, but he batted a 2400 in both eyes. Uh, he had thin corneas at 512, and his CDR was 0 0.65 in the right and 0 0.85 in the left. Um, as you can see from the field and the uh, um, uh, OCT, that he had early uh, glaucoma in the right eye and advanced glaucoma in the left. And so the question was, what should we do next? Um, here we have a patient who would benefit with cataracts alone because he had some, some slight narrowing of his angles um, uh, and uh, we could continue him on medications um, uh, thinking that maybe the cataract surgery would help uh, with lowering some of the eye pressure. Uh, we could also consider doing cataract surgery alone and then combining it with SLT later or before. Uh, we can consider doing the cataract surgery combined with the um, minimally invasive glaucoma procedure. Um, and then we could also consider doing the, uh, the surgery combined with the traditional surgery, especially with the left eye. 
So what we ended up doing was doing a cataract surgery combined with trabectone. Uh, so his target pressure was set at 15 and 12, and pre-surgery he was at 20 and 17 on one medication. Uh, so at postoperatively he did extremely well. His pressures came down to 11 and 10, uh, one month, uh, 13, uh, uh, 11 and 13, uh, and at one year, nine and 12. And he's a patient of mine that I've continued to see even past this. This is a case that uh, comes directly from one of the cases in my book. And uh, he's post four to five years out now and still well controlled on no medications. So this is an example of a really great case of someone who, whether advanced glaucoma or early glaucoma, can have a really great outcome um, doing uh, the trabectum procedure, and in this case, combined with cataract surgery. Uh, so this is an example of what I would consider a poor candidate for this type of um, uh, mixed procedure. Uh, this is a patient who came in with um, uh, uh, pretty uh, some moderate uh, to advanced glaucoma in the left eye and early in the right eye. His pressures were in the 30s, and he was started on some topical medication. It was really responsive to, responsive to the topical medication, and pressures came down to the uh, mid-teens. Uh, and he... Um, uh, then subsequently was lost to follow up. And just a year later, he came back in his visual field to look like this. So this is someone who has significantly progressive, uh, aggressive glaucoma and uh, someone who um, with his nerve at this time already uh, coming out to a 0.85 and 0.99 um, is somebody who I would be hesitant to do a mixed procedure on and probably would go to the more traditional surgeries just because of my concern about his nerve and his reserve. Um, if needed in the future, one could still can consider adding and uh, doing additional mixed procedures after traditional surgery. Um, but that would be this kind of aggressive case would be one where I would uh, leave it for more traditional surgery, where I really want to get the pressure down uh, to the low teen single digits. So let's now transition into talking about the surgical technique. And so one of the most important things about angle surgery is getting in the right position. And what one wants to do is to tilt the microscope, uh, typically about 30 to 45 degree angle towards you, and then to tilt the head of the patient away from you, about, again, another uh, 30 to 45 degrees. Uh, also important is getting a good view of the angle anatomy structures. So here we're looking for, um, at the top, there's Schwabe's line, and then there's um, the trabecular meshwork, that is the key target area. Uh, then you have the scleral spur, and then you have the ciliary body band. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing in uh, the OR setting, you know, which is what. Uh, one way that can be very helpful is to get a good uh, red blood reflex um, in, of Shum's canal. Uh, this will highlight where the TM is. And this can be done after making your initial incision with the corneal wound. You can go in and um, place the, um, uh, uh, you can go in and um, depress the wound to allow egress of fluid so that you can see where to incise um, the, in the TM. So first you want to get the uh, handpiece, uh, this intrabectome, the handpiece to the TM and make contact. And then you want to dimple the TM so you can start to depress. And then as you depress, you're going to then move forward so that you can take the a tip to pierce through the TM to get into Schlem's canal. Uh, and then uh, you can pause there to make sure you're in the right place and then slowly advance um, ablating the uh, uh, roof of uh, the trabecular meshwork. Here with the Trebex uh, Plus, you're doing a similar thing. You um, make contact with the trabecular meshwork, you um, dimple the trabecular meshwork, and then you engage to go through the TM into Schlem's canal, and then you um, begin to um, excise and irrigate uh, and aspirate. So as you're engaging in the TM, um, it's important to uh, engage with the, uh, the tip kind of uh, slightly pointing up as you engage, and then you advance. Uh, and this should be um, a glide. Uh, it should not be an outward push because you don't want to engage in the outer wall of Schlem's canal, which will get you into a scleral wall. Uh, so you want it to be a, um, uh, a very parallel going along the arc of um, the um, uh, trabecular meshwork. Somehow I'm getting stuck here. Mm -hmm. 
acontecer. And then here in removing the trabecular meshwork, you're going to blade along the arc, like I mentioned, um, and you're going to uh, point the foot plate uh, towards, and typically uh, we'll start going the, towards the left, um, and then uh, you kind of just uh, continue to glide. There shouldn't be a lot of torque or movement of the, um, um, uh, of the, uh, uh, the eye. Uh, and then you uh, can continually, if you feel like you're, you need to reposition, you can stop and then reinsert and then continue where you left off. So let's go over some surgical pearls. Here you see me on my hand position. One thing I'd like to note is the use of pinky power. So I like to use my pinky uh, that's holding the trabectum handpiece to help stabilize um, um, my hand. Uh, and then there's a lot of movement of the second hand, which is my, my left hand holding the gonia prism. Um, as I'm going along the arc of the eye. Also, another important thing is to make sure you start on continuous irrigation um, uh, before you enter the eye so that you can get uh, good um, uh, exposure and depth um, pressurization of the chamber as soon as you enter. Uh, so this is for surgical pearl, which is uh, getting into position for a great view. And here, um, again, I have my um, handpiece, uh, uh, my gonia prism and the um, trabectum. Uh, here is a great view. You can see the very clear view of the um, structures. And you turn the patient's head away from you, as I mentioned before, and you also turn the scope microscope towards you. Um, and it's important to be aggressive with turning the patient's head away. Here I am getting a, a good view under the microscope. I feel that's not um, enough, so I turn the patient's head some more. Um, be uh, very uh, um, ease and ease to be able to turn the patient's head some more if you're not in a view, good view. And it's important to get that first before you start entering the eye. So the next pearl is to not forget the XY microscope. This might be seem like a small um, issue, but sometimes it can become um, very annoying if uh, you don't press on this button uh, to make sure that it's XY right before you do uh, your um, uh, trabectum or trabex uh, procedure. And here I am uh, trying to get magnification and get to the good view of that angle. And for some reason I'm stopped and it's because I didn't XY the uh, machine uh, before uh, and I wasn't able to get the full magnification that I wanted. Uh, so then I, I had to disengage and uh, take my hand away, move the microscope, and then now I can get into position so I can have an adequate view. Uh, so just a minor point to remember. And then the third pearl is to use that 1.8 millimeter corneal incision. I always do um, my trabectome or trabex plus first um, because I want to use that um, 1.8 millimeter incision. Sometimes um, it can be a suggestion to make an inter internal uh, flare so that you have a little bit more widening internally so that you can have a wider arc of ablation. Um, I used to do that. I don't do that anymore, but uh, in the beginning stages, it was helpful for me to be able to um, reach uh, wide arcs. Um, but the uh, important thing is to avoid a wide corneal incision. So for example, if you do the phaco first and you use like a 2.2 or 2.4 millimeter blade, uh, you have a much wider incision than the 1.8. And that, that difference uh, makes, makes a difference. Uh, because for example here, this is a case where I, I was using my blade to make an internal flare um, but because the patient's eye was um, roving a bit, um, I ended up making the external opening wider than the uh, 1.8. Uh, and so because of this, um, what ended up happening is I wasn't able to get uh, the best um, internal uh, pressurization. And so the fluidics um, work best when there's a, a tight closure around the handpiece uh, because it allows the fluid to stay in the eye. Um, and so here, my cornea is, is um, uh, the striae, uh, it's not as clear. Um, I'm kind of wondering why that is. Um, and you can see here, there's a wound gape around. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot, but it's enough. Uh, and so now when I go to pierce the TM, uh, the TM is um, very easily, uh, I easily get heme. And I'm wondering, how is it that I'm getting heme? I don't usually get heme when I do this procedure. Um, and it's because of that lack of pressurization. Um, also, another thing to think about 
is if this happens is um, it could also be that the bottle height was not high enough. That has also been um, over area to troubleshoot. Sometimes if the uh, assistant lowers the bottle height when they're preparing uh, the trabectone unit, um, um, that could be the reason why there's um, not good pressurization. So you can raise the bottle height, bottle height, and that will give you more um, pressure reduction, um, more pressurization. Another pearl is um, again talking about the ablation, and it should be something that's very smooth. Uh, ideally, you want to pierce the TM, get into some canal, and you want to engage and start ablation, and it should be a nice fluid motion. See how uh, the eye has a minimal torquing. Um, it's uh, something that it's not, um, I'm not using a lot of pressure um, or a lot of uh, push in order to ablate that tissue. It's very smooth versus using a lot of torque. If you find that you are trying to make an incision and you're going in and you're finding you're turning the eye, look, I'm turning the eye and I'm getting stria in the cornea because I'm pulling so hard. It's, uh, I'm not in the right position. I've I've extended past the schlums now into the outer wall. And this is not good because uh, you don't want to do anything that could uh, risk um, having uh, an injury to your collector channel osteo. So um, uh, you want to stop, or you want to re-engage. If, if you start to re-engage in that same position and the same thing is happening, you should find another spot uh, to go to and start over. Um, you can just bypass that area and then start to re-engage in a different part of the TM. And then this is my final portal about hydrating corneal wounds. One of the best ways to prevent um, hyphemas postoperatively is to make sure you have good hydration and pressurization of the chamber at the very end of the case. So here I am hydrating my corneal wounds and I touch on the top to see, see there's a lot of dimpling there. That's too much dimpling. That means that the pressurization is not good. And you'll see a little arrow that comes. And this is an arrow where I see a little bloop of pain. And that means that the collector channels are not tamponaded because the pressure is not high enough. So you have to go back in, keep pressure, um, pressurizing the eye, the chamber, so that you see there's minimal dimpling um, with the, the tip of the cannula. And this allows me to know that I've gotten to the eye to um, the pressurization that's adequate. This is about high 20s to um, uh, um, low 30s uh, pressure. So now let's talk about what to um, uh, do post-op. So the first day, you can tell your patients that they should expect some level of some blurred vision. Um, it can sometimes not be, be the case that it's that bad, but when there's some pain that you're going to expect at the time of the surgery, there's going to be some red blood cells that may be occluding um, the vision somewhat. And so uh, it's, it's good to let them know that the vision is going to be a bit blurred. This uh, blood clears very quickly from the eye. So uh, typically you're gonna see uh, post-op day one, a clear cornea, um, AC that has maybe one to two plus cell, uh, white blood cells mixed with RBCs. Um, this usually clears in a few days. Uh, so usually we see patients back the first day and then a week later, by a week later, uh, the majority um, of those uh, cells have cleared. Uh, the eye, eye pressure typically is low, but if for any reason it's ever elevated, I would work the wound at the paracentesis. Um, restrictions are uh, similar for cataract surgery with additional th three days of no heavy lifting or, or stooping and then using um, a, the uh, shield at night for at least three nights. Um, holding off blood thinners uh, for a couple days after the surgery uh, unless um, they really have to get back on it. Uh, so what should you look like uh, look for on gonioscopy? At the first week, you want to look for uh, something that looks like this, a white sheen that indicates the outer wall of Schlem's canal, and uh, um, this should be in the nasal quadrant. Um, in the other quadrants, um, you also want to look to see if there's any evidence of PAS formation. Um, this is something that you look for at the first week's uh, visit. If there is any sign of PAS, then I will start the patient on pilocarpine. Pilocarpine is not something I routinely use for, say, phaco trabectomes. Um, um, well, but I do routinely use it if it's um, just a fake patient that had trabectome um, or if I see any signs of early PAS. Um, and I typically will use it three times, to, two to three times a day for about three to four weeks. Um, typically my regimen postoperatively is to put them on a steroid. In the past, I have used Durazol. Um, I did get some pressure spikes with Durazol and found that sometimes I had difficulty in the tapering of uh, Durazol. Um, so I am now using um, uh, prednisolone. 
that is in a compounded uh, drop uh, that is also has um, uh, catorolac and gatafloxacin. And I use that four times a day uh, for my phaco trabectone patients, uh, trabex patients. And then I use uh, for if it's a lone case, a standalone case, I'll use it. Um, uh, I'll use it uh, for a combined case about five weeks and for a standalone case about uh, three to four weeks, depending on um, how they're healing. Uh, the um, uh, medications, and I will typically stop the prostaglandin, uh, just trying to help minimize any kind of um, uh, extra um, um, uh, slowing of wound healing. Uh, and I will continue their other drops, uh, typically the same. I try to tease off drops as I go along because one, you can have some pressure spikes relating to use of steroids. And so you wanna have the medications on board for that. Uh, two, I find that it's better to uh, slowly take them off the medicines as opposed to taking them off and having to put them back on. The patients can maybe see the surgery is not going as well if you go in that, in that order. And then all the other uh, drops the same in the other eye. Um, if a patient is known to have a steroid response, um, uh, or if they do uh, have one during the course of uh, treatment postoperatively, you can switch them over to uh, lower dose st um, steroid like Rotamax or Inveltis, or even uh, just simply use NSAIDs and at a higher dose. So, in regards to uh, where we can be considering the irrigating a goniectomy, uh, it really is uh, available to be used at any part of the glaucoma management spectrum. Um, it's not just after laser uh, and after medications before incisional surgeries. It can be um, uh, when you're diagnosing a patient who has cataract and they also have glaucoma, maybe you skip going to the medications and you go straight to a combined procedure. Um, it can be done after a patient's already had a failed trabeculectomy or tube shunt. Um, and you're now trying to provide another option for decreasing of eye pressure. Uh, so depending on the scenario, there are a lot of reasons why this type of procedure can be a good option for your patients. And so it's not usually something that you would have trouble finding patients in your uh, population uh, for using this. Uh, another great aspect of uh, this procedure is its code. It's a very stable CPT code um, and is well um, uh, recognized or uh, well utilized by uh, just about any insurance. I never have pushback uh, with this procedure uh, because there's so many on-label uses for it. Um, and uh, because of its um, uh, price compared to cataract surgery, it would be the full price of a reimbursement for the goniotomy and then half for the cataract procedure. Um, and so yeah, it's a great um, procedure in terms of uh, reimbursement. Uh, so uh, I'd like to um, uh, I hope that the slides that I showed and the videos I shared were of value to you. Uh, for those of you who would be interested in taking a deeper dive, if you uh, like things that I've showed you, uh, there's more of it um, in the Building Blocks of Trabectome Surgery. Um, it's a book that has almost 300 pages and 10 chapters, um, chapters that are filled with good cases and also cases to avoid, um, as well as a chapter, a 30 page chapter on goniotomy with uh, lots of illustrations. Uh, to uh, discuss angle anatomy and different uh, nuances of things to look for. Um, it also is uh, filled with uh, discussions on doctor-patient conversations, as well as other aspects of evaluating the patient in the clinic setting. Um, and I'd like to give a special offer for those who are on uh, line today with me, a uh, 30% off um, using the code TRAB2020. Uh, if you go to the uh, kuglerpublications.com and just put the name of the book in the search box, uh, that'll come up and you can use that code. Um, and then for those of you who are um, uh, maybe like more visual learning, uh, I've also have a iGlaucoma YouTube channel and um, I have a number of a library of videos. I um, mean, there's a series called Migs University and there is a feature of Trabectome in that series uh, talking about the what, where, why, how, uh, and in who. Uh, and uh, that's a a four-part video series, and I invite you to uh, check those videos out in addition to the other videos and other mixed procedures or other glaucoma procedures that are on the site. And so with that being said, I hope that I have some time for some question and answers. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. OKK. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, you do have some questions for you in the queue, so we'll go a couple, uh, couple minutes longer if we can. Uh, the first question is, uh, can you use irrigating goniectomy devices for congenital glaucoma in patients with clear cornea? 
Um, this is something that you can use in um, uh, pediatric cases. Um, I personally don't do a lot of pediatric cases, but I know people who use, uh, who have used uh, uh, trabectome for those cases. Uh, so it is something that can be applied there. Excellent, thank you. Our next question is, in which situation would you not advise goniectomy? Uh, so um, I had um, made some mentioning, like when there is really high PAS, I mean, there are times, like I mentioned before, I can do some um, goniosynucleolysis uh, with the uh, so trabectome handpiece. Uh, but if it's really high PAS, say a patient is uveitic or they've had issues of hypotony in the past and there's a lot of cor cornea iris touch, just like high PAS, it's not a good indication for that. Also, if it's a patient who has a neovascular glaucoma, there has been like maybe one or two cases of patients who had really early neovascularization uh, NVG with um, their angles still wide open, um, no PAS formation that I did the procedure on and had gotten some, some success with the use of still some heavy medications. But for the most part with NVG, uh, it's not indicated because um, there's just a lot of propensity for scarring um, and closure. Uh, it's not something that would be uh, recommended. Um, also with um, uh, tra traumatic cases, especially when there's a lot of angle recession, uh, the changes that are happening in the an anatomy of uh, the outflow system in those cases um, are very questionable. If it's just a very minimal and not in the nasal angle, that might be something to consider. But if it's involving the nasal angle, the chances of success are much lower. Excellent. Thank you. The next question is, uh, do you modify your post-op medication or follow-ups when doing solo goniectomy versus goniectomy with cataract surgery? Yeah, I do tend to, um, uh, with patients who have, uh, who are phagic and are having just trabectome alone, uh, I mentioned that I do use pilocarpine for them. Uh, and that's not something I routinely use with the cataract phaco. I also um, might uh, uh, watch them a little bit closer if I'm concerned about uh, their angles, uh, just to make sure that I'm um, uh, appropriately um, managing them with the pilocarpine, uh, usually go with BID, maybe I might increase the, to uh, TID or QID if needed. Uh, so that's really the main change um, that I, the use of pilocarpine and possibly a little bit more um, watching of that angle uh, with gonioscopy and uh, maybe uh, um, an extra visit if I'm really concerned. Thank you. Next question we have is, uh, you mentioned that you would flare your internal and the internal lip of your incision, um, but have since stopped. Can you tell us why that is? Um, I, I don't know if it's more of um, a, a feeling more comfortable with um, uh, uh, doing the procedure and being able to manipulate and move my hands more to be able to get to those ang um, to the far angles and feeling I don't necessarily need to do that. Um, I, uh, I, I think that that's probably why. In the beginning, I felt um, it made sense that I would be able to have a wider arc ability, and I was really trying to get um, more closer to uh, five or six degrees as opposed to just uh, three or four. Um, and now I feel that I'm able to still get wider arcs even without making those insert internal uh, incisions. Very good. Thank you. So two more questions for you, Dr. OKK. Uh, our next one is, how many cases would you say it takes to feel comfortable with goniectomy? Um, I would say, and I kind of feel this way with just about any MIGS procedure, I think that if you've done about 10 cases and they were a mix of good cases and some cases where there was a learning curve, um, I think that that's enough to feel uh, somewhat comfortable. But I think when you talk about feeling like you've more mastered it, you need to have probably about maybe 30 cases on, under your belt. Um, so I feel like there's a, okay, I have the technique down, uh, but then as you continue to do more surgeries, there's some nuances that you start to find. There's some variabilities of anatomy that you start to see. Um, sometimes the TM is not uh, it's more rigid in some eyes than others. And you can find that uh, a case might be a little bit more challenging than uh, one where the TM is just really um, easy to glide through. So um, I do feel like 
probably by 10 cases if it's been a good mix. Um, sometimes you can be fooled if you just have all these really great easy cases, you feel like you know everything and then all of a sudden you have a challenging case and you're like, what is that? So to get that variability, um, I think that um, 10 cases to uh, feel like, okay, I'm ready to still, uh, I've got, done this and I have the routine down, but up to 30 uh, to feel like you really mastered it and have had seen all, a lot of nuances that um, help you feel uh, really good and maybe even at the point where you can be training. Very good. Thank you. Our last question is, with the significant clinical results behind trabectome, why has the technology not been more widely adapted, in your opinion? Um, in all honesty, I think that it has to do um, with marketing. I think that uh, we now have MST who has access to this technology and um, I'm really looking forward to their ability to take it to the next level. I feel like after using it for a decade, um, I've been a, you know, I wrote a book about it, not because anyone asked me to, but because I felt like I found this, this wonderful procedure that was really helping a lot of my patients and it was like the secret that I felt like people really needed to know about. And um, I think that it's just about, you know, uh, to be honest, marketing. Uh, and I think that with uh, 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 empowered with MST now to have the uh, the, the breath uh, to to help to market with things like this, like these webinars, um, I think that the word will get out and people will start using it and really see the power that it has uh, to give really great outcomes.